My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Thursday, April 21st, 2016, and I'm interviewing veterinarian Nancy Johnson for the O-State Stories interview series sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. This is also a CEC interview. Uh, Nancy, you did your undergraduate work at Vassar and MIT. You went back to school and in your mid-30s you got your vet med degree. I understand you worked both with mixed animals, large and small, but then you've focused on small animals, uh, sans companion animals, and you're about to sell your practice. I look forward to hearing more about your life and career and your OSU memories. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Okay, I was born about nine miles from Canada in, on the Iron Range of Virginia, Minnesota and uh, it was very cold up there and my parents stayed two years and headed for California. So I grew <laughs> up in California, mostly on the beach. <laughs> um, any brothers or sisters? I had one brother who passed away about seven years ago. And what did your folks do for a living? My husband, I mean my father was, uh, he, he ran a tile laying business. He did most of the swimming pools and bathrooms and things in Hollywood Hills for the stars in the 1950s. Wow. And my mother was a beautician and owned five beauty shops. What was it like growing up in, were you in L.A. or what part of California? Um, Santa Monica and uh, Dorsey High School was in Crenshaw area, which is where Rodeo Drive is, uh, which is pretty famous. Wow, yes. So, yeah. yeah. What was it like growing up there? Well, it was a... Uh, the 60s and 50s were kind of a uh, very interesting time, you know. Um, I lived through the Watts riots where all the uh, restaurants had armed police and guns in the middle of the restaurants. And But our school was, um, we were a mixed neighborhood, which in general was wonderful. The students got along well. Probably 85% of my school was non-white and 95% of my school went to college. So it was a very cosmopolitan, mixed uh, background mm -hmm. and a lot of freedom. <laughs> we, didn't did did we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have cell phones and I can remember at 12 I biking to the beach, 12 miles to the beach and on a bike and none of our parents ever worried about us. I guess they just thought we'd come home. How fun. <laughs> so that was one of your primary activities for fun was going to the beach? Oh yeah. <laughs> California and the beach life was the big thing. Right. Yeah. What was your favorite subject in school? I was always interested in chemistry and uh, biology. Was there anything that kind of pointed towards your eventual career as a vet? I uh, knew from the time I was five years old I was going to be a veterinarian. I brought every dog and cat home that I could find and my mother has pictures of me riding horses strapped in at 18 months old and pictures of me at nine months dropping cookies out of my uh, carriage with the dogs following us so I've always been dragging things home. <laughs> oh, so that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Did either of your parents go to college? My mother went to college, yeah. Mm -hmm. After you graduated high school, what did you do? I went straight on to college. Uh -huh. um, At Vassar first? Yeah, uh -huh. I went to Vassar and uh, studying chemistry, science. math, okay. math minor, mm -hmm. and child study minor. I had four minors. And then from there to MIT, yeah. were you thinking of veterinary med already, or were you just... Yes, I always was going to be a veterinarian, but mm -hmm. I got married and I transferred to MIT where my husband got his degrees. I see, okay. And so I went to school there. What year did you start um, veterinary medicine at OSU? Good Lord, I think 1980. Okay. That's a long time ago. <laughs> And what was, um, I mean, how did you land here in Oklahoma? We came here so I could go to veterinary school. Okay. My husband took a job at OSU so I could come to veterinary school. Why did you, so you picked OSU first yourself before your husband even applied for a job here? Or? Um, he got offers from OU and OSU because of the field he was in, in electronics. And um, we had looked around and I could afford to go to OSU. I had looked at Tufts, but it was $30,000 deposit. We didn't have that kind of money. So we uh, came here. And you shared an interesting story that I think your daughter started at the same time or a year after you? No, my daughter, um, my, 
my oldest daughter, Dr. Carolyn Cash, just graduated from veterinary school not too much, you know, maybe, like maybe four or five years after me. After you, yeah. yeah. So yeah. almost yeah. simultaneous studies. What were some of the challenges you encountered um, in the vet med school? Well, I had three children, and we ran a goat dairy, so it was ours because we had 125 on the milk line, and my husband was a professor. So some of the challenges were staying awake through the classes <laughs> the first year. That that's a very yeah. <laughs> so if you ask me how to do that again, I wouldn't. <laughs> but we we went out of the goat dairy business by the second year, which made life a lot simpler. And uh, other challenges were I got I had a baby during veterinary school, which. Um, didn't mean to do, and I had to have an emergency C-section, so I missed six weeks of school because my baby had to be on heart monitors and stuff. So I have to say that OSU let me graduate, take all my testing, get my license, and come back and do my last six weeks of equine after I was licensed. Probably no other school would be that kind. Wow. So actually, I had kind of a few challenges. <laughs> some, some good support there. Yeah, so OSU was very kind to me. They knew I'd be back. They knew I wouldn't lie about it. Now, were you living in the Chandler area when you had the goat farm and everything? No, and your we husband lived in was Tryon. teaching. You, we lived okay. in Tryon, which is so not you far from here. It's closer. Like, yeah, yeah, it's about fourteen closer. miles closer to Stillwater. Um, who were some professors who stood out for you at the time? Well, uh, Dr. Corsvet was one of my favorite professors, and he was one of my interviewees. And what did um, you like about him? I don't know. He just was very straight shooter, and he seemed like a really nice guy. Um, and then, um, oh golly, I'm, just, I'm getting sold. I'll forget names. But when I had the rough time, Dr. Fox stood up for me a lot because um, I have to say, after I had my baby and things were so stressful, <laughs> I was kind of emotionally unstable. <laughs> mm -hmm. If anybody mm -hmm. gave me a real hard review at the school, I would be really hard. So sure. I worked for Dr. Fox and. Um, Helen Jordan, she's, I still see Helen a As lot. a graduate assistant, you're saying? Um, in research. In research, I, okay. To make extra money, I did some projects for Dr. Fox, and I mm -hmm. did some projects for Helen. And I, as an undergraduate, I won, won several awards for parasitology, which I was interested in. And then, um, I can't remember her name, there was a pathologist. Dr. Ewing was one of my favorite doctors. And then there was a woman um, in that department that I was very fond of, and I'm sorry, I can't remember her name right now, but... Uh, she was one of the first women to go to veterinary school. I think she went back, she was back east when she went to veterinary school. She used to visit about some of the rough times she had when she was, there was only two girls in the class and how how they were picked on. So, right. So I kind of visit with her a lot. And um, But yeah, I was mostly the people in parasitology and pathology department. Like, mm -hmm. you know, those were my favorite people. And pathology would have been what I've done, would have done if I was younger mm -hmm. and could have stayed, but mm -hmm. I, I couldn't stay in do more years I had to become a veterinarian. I mean, I love what I did, but pathology would have been what I would have done if I'd started at 20. I see. Because I like the science of it mm -hmm. and the research. And was that what the OSU uh, vet med school was known for at that point? Was the or what, what I think was? they were pretty well known for mm -hmm. their research, especially with uh, ticks and things, but it mm -hmm. wasn't just their research. I just, I find finding out why the animal died is very interesting. I just, that mm -hmm. would have been a whole other four years and I. Right. We couldn't do it. Right. What were your most challenging classes? Oh dear, anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> My best friend was the youngest person in the class and I was the oldest person and after the first anatomy <laughs> test at which I stood there the whole time, I'm not kidding, I stood there like frozen. I couldn't even hardly move. I failed it terribly. She said that she was going to get me a bottle of whiskey and put it in my thing, and we'd have a drink before we went in. So poor Dr. Friend, and uh, what's the other guy's name? Peterson. Uh, they helped me get through, but by the third time we had a test, I actually could walk from place to place. I don't know why, it just petrified me. I mean, I was petrified. I'd go in there, and I'd go, oh, I don't know what nerve that is. <laughs> so, and I remember one time, I laughed because... One time, they, you know, they would cut, they'd have a chart, and they'd cut the cow in half, and it'd just be holes, you know? And I remember I wrote on the test that if you cut the cow in half, I can guarantee you I can't put it back together and save its life, so I think this is nonsense. And I don't think they really thought that was funny, but I thought the chart was ridiculous, so. I'm not very good at, um, geometry was not my best subject, so when they do things like that, I have trouble seeing 
Right, the spatial. Yeah, I right. have trouble with that. That wouldn't be my forte, so I found that hard. But I got through it. I think I got a B, finally, after a few shots of whiskey and a lot of encouragement. <laughs> what um, buildings did you have your classes in? Oh, it was the old classroom building, I guess that's mm -hmm. what they, yeah, mm -hmm. mostly. And then the old hospital, yeah. What was the environment on the campus like outside of the vet med program, or did you even have time to explore it? I was too busy with children at home yeah. and in a family. I really didn't, um, the only time I ever did anything really with the class was on the senior trip, and mm -hmm. we had a good time. Mm -hmm. But in general, I wasn't, you know, going out on weekends and stuff with the class. Right. Yeah, it was not possible. So, as a matter of fact, one of my classmates, Diane Dickerson, and her mother and my husband were carpooling to the university, so um, she has Shepherd's Cross and, in Claremore, and we're still great friends. As a matter of fact, I, I help sponsor her mission trips to Africa and different places. And uh, so they're some of our oldest friends because we carpooled before we went to veterinary school together. So <laughs> we'd let my husband and her mom drive, and we'd study anatomy and stuff in the back seat, <laughs> flashcards. So. So, I, I mean, I still made, like, Becky King and different people friends that I still consider good friends, mm -hmm. but I didn't really have time to socialize much out of my family. Right. Because I was older. And probably even with your husband teaching there, you, you didn't get a chance to go to sporting events too much or anything like that. No. And yeah. my husband's a hockey player, so he's not okay. too into football and basketball. <laughs> he's not into those other things. We took part in the sporting events more when our kids went to college and played in the band and stuff like that. Then we went to the football games, you know, to watch the kids and stuff. Right, yeah. right. Um, when you had time, was there a place on campus that you liked to go to study or hang out? when you had extra time? or were I think always? I just spent time in the library when I had time. And what was the library like in those days? It was a nice musky library. It was just <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> no longer? But, but mostly we were, you know, you were pretty busy all day in those days. I, mm -hmm. mean, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of time after class to do much. You ended up going home and studying mostly. Right. Yeah, because it was a pretty long day. Right. How about um, some of the events like homecoming? I don't know if your husband had to. The only thing my husband had to go to is he has a lot of, had a lot of graduate PhD and master's students, so he mm -hmm. went to all that stuff. The graduations and things. Yeah, but uh -huh. I didn't always accompany him because he'd go to the hoodings. I have we have gone several years, even with our grandchildren, to the homecoming because mm -hmm. the kids like that, and so we've done the homecoming several times. And right, you know. Threatened grandchildren they couldn't go unless they got potty trained and stuff like that. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> you can't go to homecoming in diapers. It works. <laughs> well, um, the town of Stillwater has changed quite quite a bit since you got your degree. Do you um, have any thoughts on some of those changes? Or uh, I've never actually lived in Stillwater, and um, but we think it's we have we did buy a house this last year, which we have rented out to some friends' kids. Which is, you can see the front door of the veterinary school from our new house. Oh, you can? Okay. Yes, and my husband wonders why we didn't buy that when I went to veterinary school. But we bought it from a friend. And uh, our, of our seven grandchildren, I'm sure at least four will be going to OSU. And so one goes next year. So we bought a house to help the kids have a place for the kids to live. Oh, how neat. So we've got it rented out now and probably for next year. And then the next year we'll probably have our grandchildren start to stay in it. So. Right. But I love the town. I've gone to Total Health after I had a knee replacement. And uh -huh. Helen and several of the people in uh, Oak Creek want me to buy a unit there, and I keep telling them I know it would be great, except I'm just not ready to give up, give up my home right now. <laughs> but, you know, we, we think that's a great idea for the community living and being close to everything because we do. We've always been sponsors of the arts. We've always had season tickets to the Saraton Center and the theater. Okay. Because we're big, and my husband's so always... So you do do that. Yeah, and my husband's always... Well, we've always done that. And my husband's always been in the choir, the mm -hmm. community singers, until oh. this last year when he retired. So we always, you know, we do... We're a lot into music and arts, more than sports. Right, but, right. Yeah. Um, so we love OSU. I mean, we love Stillwater, and I think it's a great place to live. How did you celebrate your graduation day? I think we just got the whole family together and had dinner. That was a lot of people. <laughs> and maybe and probably slept for the week afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> right, slept in. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so what happened after graduation? What was the first job 
that job you got. Okay, well, I, Dr. Blonsik, who was in the second graduating class at OSU, had, I had worked for him for a summer, and he wrote my letter of recommendation at OSU. And um, before I graduated, he invited me to become part of his practice, so I already had a job when I graduated. So I worked with him and Dr. Stone for, I think, about two years. And his practice was in? In Chandler. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's Chandler Animal Clinic is considered a centennial practice. Mm -hmm. so. But you had a couple of interesting interviews you mentioned to me when you were applying well, for yes. jobs. Well, um, yes. You know, you have to consider the time. Um, both of my interviews, the people at the interviews, not all the people, but some of the people, um, asked me more about how I was going to take care of my children and my husband, not really why I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I thought I'd really messed up both interviews because at one of them I kind of got a little angry and asked them why were they asking me if my children were going to starve and what, you know, what business was it of theirs, how I took care of my family. And um, I told them I'd come to be a veterinarian and I thought they would be more interested in why I wanted to do that. But the same part of uh, that kind of psychology was very current then because when I went to open my own practice and I did... Um, a very good job of a prospectus and, and studied the Lincoln County. And after I left Dr. Blonsik's uh, practice and I was going to set up my own practice, I submitted that to the bank. And um, they were willing to give me the loan as long as my husband signed for it. And my husband was so livid because being from California, he was raised that, you know, women could do anything and his mother, you know, was a business person. And I said, well, you know, we're just going to co-sign it because I need the money. But he said, well, I hope they know if you die, I can't run a veterinary practice. So it was just the times that women, I was actually the first woman to start a business in Chandler without her husband being in business with her. And my husband wasn't really in business with me. He wasn't a veterinarian. But it was the times. And I, when I was in school, um, it was really common for like, I remember when you, we were working built bulls and things, and the girls would get all upset because the male veterinarians, especially the older men, would want to protect them from being underneath the bull and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And they'd get all upset, and I said, well, you do realize they have girls at home that are your age that are their daughters, and they're not too concerned if one of the men get kicked in the face, but they're only treating you like their daughter. They're not trying to be disrespectful. And I spent a lot of my time quieting younger girls down, saying, you know, give them a little space. It's hard for them to get used to that girls are going to be sitting under bulls and, and taking semen and stuff, you know. It just <laughs> So it was, I just took it as... You know, things were changing, but it takes time for people to change. Having that maturity was Well, helpful. I was a lot Simpler. older. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, you, there, you want to save your fights for important things. You know, get the money and prove yourself. And, you know, that's now I can get a loan any place on my signature because I've proven myself. But at that time, I was an unknown quantity, and I was a woman. Right, right. So. What was the ratio, I'm curious, of women to men in your, in your graduate class? You know, I don't class? know. I think it was about a third women, but okay. I, I don't think it is. Now it's half and half. Or right. 60, 40 men or less. We right. need more men in veterinary medicine, I think. We need more men in teaching, too. So, right. you know, the, the number of women is up, which is not bad, except that I think it's good to have male uh, influences and in mm -hmm. teaching and stuff, too, for mm -hmm. children. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't. Now, when you got your loan from the bank, had you applied with another bank? Was that your first application and it was successful? Uh huh. Because you knew how to approach it. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it wasn't a problem. Except when I went in business, the mortgage, the interest rate was 17.5% at that time. So I worked wow. the first year for the bank until I could get a small business loan because they say you can get a small business loan, but you have to have a year of proof that you have a business. Then they dropped it to 8.5%. So I worked the first year to pay the bank. Oh. Essentially, I made no money. That yeah. was tough. Did you have one employee, or I had me and somebody for twenty hours a week. Mm -hmm. I, I worked nine months without a day off. I worked every day because that's how you start a business. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, how did you go about um, building your client base? Um, I did a little advertising the paper, but I spoke like at any place they'd let me speak. I visited all the schools. Third, third grade was my grade that I thought was easiest to talk to, and we'd bring animals and talk to them and send things home. And it just took about, well, it's kind of interesting because I have this new veterinarian that started two and a half month, uh, years ago when I had my knee surgery, and she's been working for me full time and, um, you know, is probably going to buy my practice this year. And I told her two and a half years ago, I said, well, it takes about three years to get established. In other words, she wants to do equine, and so... 
um, it was cute a couple weeks ago. She said to me, I cannot believe it's been two and a half years and all of a sudden I'm doing all this equine. I guess you were right. So I find it a little amusing that the young people, they don't, you know, having experience in businesses is worthwhile. But it took me three years to really make any money at my practice. I mm -hmm. couldn't have been in practice without my husband making enough money for our family. We mm -hmm. lived on his income and we invested everything in the practice that I made back in the practice. Right. So it was a, you know, it was a long haul. Now it's successful, but... The first three years were just hard work and being there all the time. Right. But I was younger. <laughs> that worked out okay. What was, um, <coughs> Excuse me. Do you remember the most difficult moment you had in one of the one of those first three years? No, I just know that you gain experience. Like, and um, well, my daughter is going to be work, a director of one of the humane society starting next month in Tulsa, and uh, probably my daughter, Dr. Cash, and myself. Our biggest problem is. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I didn't actually know you made any money doing it. I just always wanted to be a veterinarian, and I still love to take care of puppies and nurse animals. It's just what I like to do. And so the first year I lost a lot of money because I let people charge. So getting tougher was mm -hmm. hard for me, mm -hmm. and I've never been able to get really tough. I've never been able. I know they tell you, oh, you got to turn them down, you got to let them die. I've never been able to do that, and mm -hmm. so... I don't donate a lot of money to the Humane Society and stuff like that, but I, am the, I have been the Humane Society in Chandler, Oklahoma, because we don't have one. Right, right. And, um, but that's been okay because my husband, you know, we, we made enough money. I didn't make a killing, but we made enough money. So, you know, I'm, I guess I've been lucky to be able to do that for people, and, but I did have to learn to draw the line mm -hmm. on, you know, people because mm -hmm. a lot of people would take advantage of that. So... That was the hardest let. The other thing was you get, um, at first there were some, you know, things that come in. It was a female veterinarian, and I was the, probably the first veterinarian in the county that was a female. And I know that um, my husband was away the day before my birthday in February, and we had a terrible snowstorm. And I was called out to do a C-section on a cow, and I had to leave my children at home alone, which was was hard because we were on a farm and we only had a wood stove and it was really a bad storm and my husband wasn't home. So I did go out in my, and I had a Cummings diesel truck and I went out and I cut this cow open and got this huge calf out and Dr. Balanci could swing the thing over his head like he was six foot four and I dragged it over to a fence and beat on it but it was the typical old farm. This man was, I think he must have been 85. He, he was, his wife was dead. I drove up to where the heifer cow was, and there was, to your knees, in baling wire and bags of old feeds, you know, and I had to have the, you know, the headlights on the cow. He didn't have a stanchion. And I finally got the calf and everything done, and every, he got so excited that he'd take the flashlight off when I was trying to sew her up. Then he had to go have coffee. I think it took me four and a half hours to get home by the time I sewed her up because I didn't have any help, but, you know, it was typical, you know, 1930 veterinary medicine, I think. So when I got home, my husband was relieved to see me, and I was glad to be there. And by the next day, every coffee shop in Lincoln County knew that I had saved this calf, and I was a woman. It was kind of funny. <laughs> that was a good PR boost. It was, but it was hard. And i that's the hardest thing was for me to do C-sections because uh, the hand strength. You know, right. I was already almost 40. So I preferred that Dr. Blonsky and Dr. Stone did the C-sections. <laughs> but I still remember that night because I, I looked in that barn and I thought, oh, my God, he hasn't cleaned this out in 40 years. <laughs> that was really funny. Oh, that's a great It was story. funny. Yeah, so I always tell people what they should get when they go to veterinary school. Is they I know they use computers, but I think, and I wish I'd done this because I always tell everybody, James Harriet in England has nothing on Lincoln County for stories. And I wish I'd kept a journal, not only of veterinary school, but of my practice. I mean, we've had, when I first started practicing, I had people that signed their name with an X because they couldn't read and write. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, it's changed, but it's, you know, and I had people that did ha not have internal bathrooms yet. They still had outhouses. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way things have changed and how veterinary medicine has changed and... You know, it amazed me the first time anybody would spend three or four hundred dollars on their dog, and now they come in, and that's kind of routine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the way it's changed in the last thirty some years, it's just amazing. And what are some of the challenges of you know the, just the scale, like going from treating, delivering a calf by C-section to treating a very small, you know, cat or dog? 
oh, I don't know, that's never, that wasn't a real problem. I, I had a, a, we got so business busy with small animal because, well, first of all, a lot of the vets in the area were doing both. Mm -hmm. And people that have small animal, if their animal's really sick, they don't like to know that you're gone mm -hmm. and doing large animal while their animal's in the clinic. So in the early 90s, I made the decision that we'd stop doing large animal because mm -hmm. I couldn't be both places mm -hmm. at once. And my practice wasn't really big enough to have two full-time veterinarians. And my daughter started working for me. She came back. Uh, she went to veterinary school, and and she was practicing in the uh, Houston, uh, not Houston, da Dallas area. But then she came home, and uh, I knew she was coming home because she was planning on having children. So she came home to have children and be a veterinarian. So she worked with me. So we were more one and a half vet practices because she was having children all the time. And um, so we kind of, we specialize in small animal. But I think it's hard to do both unless you have two or three people because, you know, you you small animal people, the animal is really their child. Mm. And it'd be like telling me, well, we'll be in the hospital, but we'll be gone for four hours. They just, it doesn't work out very well, mm -hmm. I don't think. So Yeah, and, and that was a, I've, I've heard that, that you're really... Um, those communication skills are so important because that's practically a family member. Well, it is. The best clients, they're family members. Because mm -hmm. the people that they're just dogs to, they don't bring them in until they're really sick or, mm -hmm. you know, they were hit by a car last week and now they're worried mm -hmm. about them. But, mm -hmm. you know, if they're family members, they call you as soon as anything happens and they bring them in and they make your best clients. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, we've done a lot of rescue too. We, we averaged about 125 animals a year that we rescued and helped and I worked with small, several small rescues. Tiny Tails was one of my favorites. She did dogs under 25 pounds, and we did a lot of um, work for her. She'd bring in, I don't know, probably five to eight spays and neuters a week mm -hmm. that she'd rescue from different places in Oklahoma, Texas, and mm -hmm. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And then they would take them to Petco in Edmond and adopt them out. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of rescue through small rescues, that probably mm -hmm. because we don't have a Humane Society in Link County, mm -hmm. and we don't have a dog pound. That's one of the challenges of working in a rural area, I imagine. Yeah, it is. So we did a lot of that work because, uh, well, that's because I think it's important. And, mm -hmm. um, and I also think being part of the community is really important. So my kids went to school here, and uh, we supported things. We particularly supported, like, the reading programs and the arts programs because everybody else supported the sports all the time. And we did sport, do some sports, but... We had a local arts council, which I was president of for six years, and then I was on the state arts council, and I've been on the museum board and helped build the museum and the puppet here theater. Here in Chandler. Yeah, the uh -huh. puppet theater here. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've done a lot of that kind of thing. So I think it's real important to take part in the community and uh, support what you believe in. Right, You know, right. And, uh, you know, we actually, our clinic services, we took a, we, three, people from three states and 17 cities come to my clinic. Wow, yeah. that's a real compliment. So I'm just saying, and I've had, you know, and I always laugh because I got a long letter from a kid because I've been in business so long that his dog had seizures and he'd been, he lived in Dallas then and, he, and he'd been the neurologist there and everybody and he wrote me this long letter because he's sure Dr. Johnson could cure the dog and it was so <laughs> cute. And I said, you know, I think you've been to the best and it was odd because it was a bird dog and it was a big dog, which is usually the seizures are in your little dog. So... I remember he called me and he said, Nancy, I'm coming home to see Dad, and I want you to put my dog to sleep. I'm going to mm. cry <laughs> so I could bury it on the farm. But being in a small town, you get really attached to the people and their dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've kept dogs alive till a kid could get home from college on, an, on dialysis so he could say goodbye to his dog. Mm. Yeah. So it, That's an important... I mean, you're more than a veterinarian, and I hate it when... They show movies where they act like the veterinarian just puts the dog to sleep. That Marley and Me or whatever. Yeah. I hated that movie. Why couldn't they just show them walking off of the sunset? Why do they have to act like the veterinarian mm -hmm. was so cold and just put the dog to sleep? Right. I right. mean, I've helped people bury dogs. You know, I mean, their veterinarian is part of their family here. Right, right. You know, it upsets me because, I mean, in a small town, I've had people when their wives die... They bring their dog in every other day with some complaint because they're so lonesome because they were married for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And they come to the veterinarian and you're like a therapist because they won't go to their doctor. I mean, we got to the point where we're teaching that poor man how to cook because she'd done everything for him for all his life. And she, when she died, he, just, he was lost. 
you know, and I mean, they don't they don't feel about the veterinarian the way they feel about their family doctor or dentist. No, they think I can it's talk. It's a much to, closer. Well, relationship. they think I can talk to animals. <laughs> I mean, I've had the experience when I was in the ER in California with my oldest son on New Year's Eve. When the doctor there found out I was a veterinarian, he was sure I could understand what was wrong with my son because it was just telepathy. And it turned out that I was right. It was a pre-flu syndrome. He wasn't having a heart condition, but. This kid was convinced once he found out as a veterinarian that I could just touch my son and I knew what was wrong. <laughs> so I find this is, I mean, I found being a, a, a veterinarian is kind of hilarious to a certain extent because they think you are some kind of voodoo doctor. But I mean, I, I think it's the best profession in the world. And I don't know if I've made, you know, maybe I, my daughter's an ER doctor, so she makes probably six times the money I make. But she's retired from that and gone into barometric pressure units. You know, she's double boarded now. Because after 15 years in the ER, passing mm -hmm. people on mm -hmm. and not knowing always the results, now mm -hmm. she's doing barometric pressure where sometimes it takes her two years to heal your mother's problem because she knows mm -hmm. she's going to lose her hand because of diabetes or something. Mm -hmm. But she's enjoying it so much more because she gets to see the results. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's veterinary medicine. I've been allowed to do, I think the best thing is, I've been allowed to do some of the craziest things. And, you know, I think one of my favorite times was when a little dog came in, it was about 14 weeks old, it was hit by a car, and I could tell it had a diaphragmatic hernia. And I was trying to put it up to OSU, but it was going to be a couple thousand dollars. And I said, okay, our, our gas anesthesia is not working, but Francis and I will try to do this. If you got $250, we'll go for it. So we did. And it's like, I used to laugh, I said it was like a mash unit, okay? So my technician breathed for the dog, and every time she breathed, I get spattered with, you know, juice. And we sold the little dog up, and it went home the next day. We got the hernia fixed in the lung, you know, in the diaphragm. And then a week or so later, when he came in to get the stitches out of the chest and all, he was in there, and in the room next door, there was another man. He said, what do you mean you fixed the diaphragmatic hernia? My dog had one, and I went to OSU, and it was $2,000, so I had to put it to sleep. I said, well, you know, I might not have been able to fix yours. This was just lucky. But I've been able to do things like say, okay, give we'll me $100. Cry. When my well, the other time I can remember when my I would like to write a book. When my daughter was going to OSU and she was a third year student, we had this cat came in that was obvious it had gotten kicked by the back legs of a jackrabbit, so all its guts were in a bag. I mean there was nothing. And I said to the lady, Well, you got a hundred dollars. I'll give it a try. My daughter's a student and we need to learn about this, but it's gonna dehiss two or three times. It's gonna be a mess. So we put a lot more than a hundred dollars into this cat, okay? Well, anyhow, it did de-hiss, but he lived, and this was a barn cat, which now became their cat called C-Note, and lived to be 17 years old. Oh, my god! So we made our money back over the next years getting shots and worming. But Carolyn got a lot of experience getting that all cleaned up, sewing it up, and then knowing it's seven, five to seven days because it's impossible to get it totally clean, come back and re-sew it up. And, but we had a relationship with that family and that cat for 17 years. And you know what? But... You know, obviously, I didn't make any money, but my daughter got a lot of experience, and we made good friends with the people, and, you know, I mean, that's how the practice grew. Right, right. You know, so we had a lot of experiences like, well, you, we'll try it. You know, it might not live, but we'll give it a chance. We're not going to put your animal to sleep. And you can't do that in any other kind of medicine. You can't say to somebody, well, let me put a pipe on your dog, your, your, your kid's arm and see if it works. You right. can't do that. Right. So, I mean, I found it. Every day was different. Every day was challenging. And I'm sure we've done some very unorthodox things. What's the most unorthodox animal you've ever treated? Oh, this was really funny. After Dr. Blonsig retired and Dr. Stone took over his practice, I gave Frank a key to my clinic. So he would come in and he could do anything he wanted. Like if he wanted to have a, he had, he has nine ch children and all these grandchildren. I just said, you want to do something there, animals, you just come do it. So one day he was in there, and I don't know whether he was just visiting, because he was getting old, and he'd fall asleep in one of the exam rooms most of the time, but we were friends. And uh, I had two people helping me by that time, a receptionist and a, another lady, and we had a groomer. Somebody came in with a big python, this huge snake, two people carrying this gigantic snake. And he came in, and I looked around. They'd all left by the back door. They were all afraid of snakes. I was the only person in that clinic. And I said to him, I said, you know, I really can't handle this snake, and I think it's egg-bound. So I did send it to OSU, and it was egg-bound. But I found out that nobody that worked for me was going to have anything to do with snakes. They were gone. <laughs> and I still remember that. Like, where did they all go? 
Now, egg bound means it yeah, was they about to pass have the eggs. eggs. Yeah, yeah, it couldn't pass, pass its through. eggs. But I can remember that was so funny. It was like it was gone. <laughs> then probably one of that the, would be scary. Then the other bad thing would happen because Frank wasn't good about wearing gloves. He was doing some cattle work, and he palpated a cow down in Sparks. And because she was showing tenismus and stuff, well, it turned out everybody there had to take rabies shots because it was a rabid cow. Oh wow! Yeah, I didn't even know that could happen. Like, oh yeah, any mammal can. Do some mm -hmm. probably a skunk or something bitter. It uh -huh. was rabid. Wow. But yeah, that was the other part. One of the times I remember being kind of frightened for everybody. Yeah, because everybody that was at that site, including Frank, were, he didn't take the shots. He said yeah. he wasn't going to do it, so he didn't get rabies. Thank God, he died of something else. But you know. Right, right. But we have had positive rabies come into our clinic, so that's kind of mm -hmm. scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there a surgery that you feel like you've gotten especially good at <laughs> over the years? <coughs> <coughs> well, obviously spaying and neutering a lot of things because we averaged about seven to nine surgeries a day most of the time. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty good at removing eyeballs, unfortunately, because my daughter didn't like to do that. It was pretty good anal glands. And... Um, I got pretty good at small dog knees. Now, if you had a big dog and it was an endurance dog, I would send it to somebody that, because, mm -hmm. and that didn't always work either, but I always felt like if you were using it for field trials, you know, a dog that weighs 45 pounds or something, and you're going to use it for field trials, I would refer that out, but the little 10 and 5 pound chihuahuas, I got pretty good at that. I, was, I did a lot of knees, unfortunately a lot of hips. Wow. Re Restection of hips because that's what has to come off when they get hit by cars. So I've done a lot of taking off hips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just that kind of general. Mm -hmm. I, I refer to eye doctors uh, most things like, you know, I have sewn up corneas when the people couldn't go anyplace because they couldn't afford it, and it mm -hmm. has worked. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I try to send them either to OSU or Dr. Schultz in the city. You mm -hmm. know, I try to refer. Because mm -hmm. I consider myself a general practitioner, but right. I also won't kill an animal if people are willing to try. You know? Right. I have a dog that... Oh, this dog was, mo this is years ago. Tripod just died. She was 18. And the lady was a nurse, so she thought she could treat the dog, so she didn't bring her in right away. It's the only dog I ever saw with gangrene. She didn't oh. start the right antibiotic soon enough. And I ended up, three surgeries later, taking everything off of this side. There wasn't even a bone left up here because it was all gangrene. So they ended up calling the dog Tripod because she only had three legs. And mm -hmm. it took like four surgeries. And, oh, she was hospital a lot. And I thought it was terrible. Like, I said, well, I have to charge you $1,000. I don't think I made any money on that $1,000 either, but Janet was a nurse, and they didn't, you know, they were working hard people. And, right, right. But, um, yeah, that was probably one of the most challenging things. My husband even remembers going in on Sunday, and I said, we got to take the whole shoulder off, so he helped me because I said, it was horrible. I never smelled gaseous Grand Green. That's the only oh, time I've ever smelled it. It was really gross. Right. So right. I've, done, I've done some things that I was amazed they turned out okay. But I always gave it a try, you know. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I always tried. So we've done, you know, big tumors and removed spleens and all sorts of stuff that mm -hmm. it took me a while to, to get it done. But, you know, mm -hmm. I have a good good book I can read. <laughs> <laughs> but so being out in a rural area 30 years ago or 20 years ago was pretty challenging. I think, mm -hmm. I think that's what makes it fun, though, because it's not the same every day. Every day is you never know what's going to happen. Exactly. You know, it's it can be anything. And... It, it was, you know, it'd be sort of like uh, Diane's going to Africa this year and I sent, and sent her a bunch of stuff to take and maybe if I'm one year I'll go with her, but she's training 70 vet assistants in this African nation because the whole nation has seven veterinarians. Oh my So God. she's going to train them so that at least they can be in the villages and help the animals. Mm -hmm. They may mm -hmm. not be able to save all their lives, but at least there'll be somebody there that can help. Right. Right. And there's such a need of veterinarians all over the world. Well, doctors and water and all sorts of things all over the world people need. Right, right. Yeah, you know, our world needs a lot of help. That's so. very true. Now, you are taking care of some puppies right now. Yeah. Um, and you just periodically do that, and you've brought home animals, I imagine, too. You ended up with... Well, animals. when I was first in practice, my clinic was 14 miles from my farm. So there was a lot of things that would get poisoned, like with strychnine or something, and I'd oh. have to take them home and put them in the bathtub because I couldn't go back and forth in the winter all night long. Right. So those things I'd bring home. But in general, um, if this uh, this dog died and it was my dog, mm. and we lost her, which was I don't, we still don't know why because the C-section went well, 
but she probably wouldn't have been able to nurse the puppies anyway. She had too many. She had seven, and she only weighed five pounds. So um, I have raised puppies for other people, though, when, like, their dog got sick and they were sick or something. Mm -hmm. And there are times when, especially at Christmas time, when you have 15 puppies you're helping people with, that when the last one dies, you're not too sad. <laughs> I, <coughs> I always yeah. get bronchitis, because when you get up every three hours at my age, you always get bronchitis before the puppies are weaned. Right. But right. I've never put anything to sleep if I thought we could save it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I do have one of my technicians is going to take him two nights this week and give me a rest. Oh, so good. We, yeah. So, because yeah. if you do it all the time, it's it's impossible. It's like having triplets at home. Yeah. Oh, exactly. You just can't. Yeah, it's difficult. And that's one of the probably the hardest time in practice. My son had endocarditis and was in the hospital for months. And then when he came home, he had to change antibiotics every six hours on his IV, and he was here. Mm -hmm. So if you came in, I would say, keep your cat right there. I'm going home to change an IV. <laughs> I mean, wow. that was five and a half months of my life because I was the only vet at the practice then when I was just bumping into walls because I was up all night and working all day. And oh. So there have been some challenges related to the family and being a veterinarian. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So. Um, so what do you think of the new veterinary building? I think it's wonderful. Have you toured it and everything? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Matter of fact... Uh, Dr. Sanders, she asked me if I wanted to be uh, on their new some board, and I, I felt I felt bad that I turned her down. But I just this is my husband's mm -hmm. first year retirement, and um, I'm trying to retire, and we want to travel a little bit. And mm -hmm. we are 70, mm -hmm. and I've had some. I'm healthy except for my bones are giving out on me. Like you know, I have a new knee and a new hand, and now I need a new back. But so I just, you know, I felt bad letting her down because I would love, and I told her maybe next year after, but we're we're going to do some traveling this year, and I don't really want to, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I could have pneumonia and be in a wheelchair, and I'll show up at the meeting and do it, and I just have never, you know, every time I've served on a committee, I do it, and right. so I don't want to be tied down to anything this year, but I think we have a wonderful new dean, and I think the school's doing really well. I'm, I love the school, you know. And your husband retired from OSU? Yeah, he was there for 33 yeah. years. Wow. Yeah, he just retired last June. Um, so how many of your children have attended OSU? All of them. All of them. Yeah, my daughter, my oldest daughter went to OSU and then came back and went to vet school. My next daughter went to OSU and then went to OU and became a medical doctor. My oldest son went to OSU and went into engineering, and my youngest son graduated with a general science degree and he just finished now he's in pediatric ultrasound and he's had a really hard time he was a premature baby and he's almost died two or three times he's had open heart mm -hmm. surgery twice mm -hmm. so um, he he would have probably been a medical doctor except he couldn't do the rigors of that much right he did ultrasound that was pretty hard after school because he just is not as strong because his heart is not as good as the other kids right. but you know but. so he's doing ultrasound pediatric ultrasound so he's that, happy, so they're all busy. I'll have that medical interest. That, yeah, yeah, all of them are pretty medically oriented, except the oldest one. He's got his own software business now. Mm. Are the people that you know aware of your OSU connection? Oh, yeah, I think most everybody knows I went to OSU. What advice would you give to students today at OSU, and maybe even vet med students? Eat better and exercise. I was amazed at how poorly students ate even when I went to school. They'd go have a Coke and a, ice and a chocolate bar at lunchtime. I'm surprised they haven't all died of pancreatitis. But I don't think the kids take enough time to exercise and eat well. I know they're kids, but mm -hmm. it just, really, just, you know, eating well, exercising, mm -hmm. and taking time to, you know, I'm not a drinker or a smoker, so, I mean, even, I mean, when I was coming up in the 60s, I would get, get to parties and they'd have pot in California and I'd turn around and say, take me home because I wanted to be a veterinarian and I didn't want to get arrested. Mm -hmm. But I think, in general, Americans need to eat better mm -hmm. and take time to exercise. Mm -hmm. And I think they should write a journal. I guess they could do it on their tablet, but I wish I'd written a journal because I've met some of the funniest people and the most interesting. And while you were going to school? Yes, while I was going to school mm -hmm. and as a veterinarian. I, I just, so many interesting things have happened. And right. I mean, I think... I know that the girl that's taking over for me, she just loves my practice and everybody that works for her. I mean, I know when I had my hand surgery, Dr. Mitchell from Tulsa came, and my daughter came, because I've had several surgeries and I had never closed my practice. 
And I know he actually, I've never met the man, but he called me and said any time I needed a veterinarian, he'd never been in such a nice practice where everybody just liked each other. Well, we treat each other like a family. We mm -hmm. take care of each other. Mm -hmm. That hurricane that came through here, I mean, the t tornado that came through, two of my workers lost their homes. Oh, my God. So we let, they got, you know, we let them off for two weeks. And Francis and I were the only person in our clinic for two weeks. And we were working 14-hour days. And finally, one day, I said, put a sign on the door. We're going to lunch. Even Jesus had to eat. But, I mean, we were taking dogs off the street that roamed up. And I had a Pyrenees for four weeks before somebody came from Sparks and said, did you see my dog? I said, yeah, he's out back. I mean, it was just, you know, and, you know, so we treat each other like family and I think that's the secret about a veterinary degree uh, business or mm -hmm. any business or going to school with people is just treat them how you treat a family member mm -hmm. be considerate of them and I've never lost a worker for any real bad reasons in general and I don't know I have people that work for me for 28 years and they're still working for me and they're gonna work for the next girl until they retire I mean it's been like a big family and I know that big practices are different but I, we've gone to meetings where after the meeting my technicians will say, oh, God, when you left, they were asking us, you know, all these questions. And we finally just looked at them and said, well, we don't know what to tell you. We like each other. <laughs> we're like, they're all fighting in these practices. And they go, we just like each other, you know. We take care of each other. So I've had a really good experience being a veterinarian. And I've had people that, you know, coming back in storms and stuff, one night I saw the lights on and I knew it was a dairy farm, so I stopped in. His wife made me some coffee because I'd pulled a cap and I was so sleepy I didn't think I was going to make it home. And, you know, they, I knocked on the door and, well, come on in. Do you need a cup of coffee? I need something. I'm going to not make it home in this snowstorm. <laughs> so I like rural practice and I like being part of the people's lives. Yeah. So I guess that'll change over the years and I guess people are going to get more, you know, indifferent and isolated. But I hope not because that's what really makes it fun, knowing yeah. the people. Maybe not. We'll, we'll hope not. I don't think in the rural areas you get that way too much because you just know them. You know, right. there's not that many of us out here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I love what I did. I I would continue to do it if I was stronger, but I'm. Mm. It's time for me to quit because of my back and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, what advice would you give to OSU faculty or administrators? Gee, I don't know because I don't know what they're going through. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know what, you know, the interview process and everything's like. Mm -hmm. But I think the most important thing is somebody that really wants to be a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm the smartest person that ever went to OSU, and I think I'm a good veterinarian. I don't think I'm a star veterinarian, but I have no ego involved with it. So when you bring your animal in and I tell you you need to go see Dr. Schultz or you don't go out of the university, mm -hmm. then I have no problem referring people because I consider myself a general practitioner. I don't consider myself a specialist. So all I know is that's the only thing I ever wanted to do. When we got married, my husband promised me that he, we would move wherever I wanted to go to veterinary school. So he went through five degrees at MIT. And then we were in California, and then he got an offer out here so I could go to veterinary school. And so we've been married for 50 years. And your commitments, keeping your commitments through thick and thin is what I recommend to everybody. So I guess looking for the kids that have a commitment, because if they want to do it, they're going to be good at it. Mm-hmm. And veterinary medicine, like any medicine, I mean, ER doctor, it's a commitment. It's hard work. You know, I mean, there's not enough money to pay somebody to be an ER doctor in the United States either. you got to really want to help people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just looking for those kids that really want to be a veterinarian. And then you happen to make money, that's nice too. And I don't know, I think they should somehow get the cost down. But it took us 17 years of our marriage to pay off our, our debts. We. Mm -hmm. We had to pay off all our loans, and we just didn't have a new car or anything. I mean, we lived with that, but I guess kids nowadays expect more stuff early. You know, we didn't get our first new car until we were married like 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe expectations are different, but yeah. I know that Rebecca, who's going to hopefully join our practice when she graduates, um, she's just really a... I think she got just voted the kind doctor of the year in senior class, oh, and she neat. is that sweet. Uh-huh. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I look for in a, somebody to come join the practice. Somebody that worries about the animals and the people, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Because we're all going to be good at different things, you know, and everybody's trainable. But it's if you like people, if you don't like people, you shouldn't be a veterinarian. I mean, I've had people throw files at me. I've had people accuse me of, 
you know, getting their dog off the street was hit by a car to make money. And I'm like, no, the lady brought it in because you weren't around and the dog got hit by a car. You know, I, mean, I didn't go get your dog. But I mean, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. run into mm -hmm. all sorts of people. And you got to have a, a sense of humor and realize that, unfortunately, not all people are working with a full deck of cards. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of like it could be a good sitcom is what it could be. But no, I think it's, I don't, I'd still do it again. Uh-huh. I mean, I loved every minute of it. Well, it seems like a lot of OSU students and alumni are pretty loyal to the school. What do you think it is about OSU that sparks that kind of loyalty? Well, I don't know. I think it's just a nice atmosphere at OSU. The town is not too big. Um, I didn't have, you know, I'm not young, so I don't, but I know that Dr. Fox and different people helped me and actually took me in and, you know, kind of cuddled me because... There was a couple times after my son, who was on a, a monitor at home, and um, I had a girl that didn't speak English taking care of him from Dom Dominican Republic, that I, I was very stressed. Mm -hmm. And they would say it was going to be all right. And I just think that the whole university is set up to help the kids get through. You know, if they need, if they have anxiety and stuff, I know that we just, uh, people from the mental health and the student health came and talked to the professors group last time we had a meeting and talking about how, how much outreach they have to help the kids if they're having too much anxiety. Mm -hmm. And they need to take advantage of all that because there probably is more stress in our society. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, and but I've always found that the people at OSU were always nice to, I mean, they didn't have to let me graduate. They didn't have to let me take all my tests because mm -hmm. I hadn't really finished my coursework, but they knew I'd commit, you know, come back and fulfill my commitments. They trusted me. Right. You know, so, I mean, I think that kind of trust of the students is helpful. So, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I just enjoyed the school. It's a nice atmosphere. Of course, we love all the theater and stuff, too. You know, we support all that stuff. It's, you know, there's all the music and stuff, too. And I wish the kids would take more advantage of live theater and live music. They don't go as much as I'd like to see them go, you know. But I'm not into this stuff. Right. <laughs> I'm not into the computer stuff. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about or cover that we didn't cover today? I've, I've had a lot of experiences. I just wish I'd kept a... I wish I'd kept a log because uh, I could write a heck of a book if I could remember stuff well, better. You still have that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe you no, should. No, it's, it's been, it's like been, it's, we've had some really funny experiences and some really wonderful stories. Well, really wonderful results, taking chances that, you know, people right. would let us take the chance. I don't know if we right. made any money on that stuff, but it, it didn't matter. We, it was, you know, it was. You saved the animal. Well, it was, yeah, most of the time the animal lived, which always yeah. amazed me, you know. <laughs> And the hardest thing, I think, is when you're a veterinarian is times I've sent animals home because they think I can save it. I mean, really badly hit animals like their legs are squashed mm -hmm. or something, and they don't want to take the leg off. And So sometimes I've had to send animals home with all the care instructions so that I know they bring it back in 24 hours and they realize it needs to be put to sleep, you know. Mm -hmm. Put it on painkillers and show them how much trouble it's going to be to try to take care of a leg that's going to be necrotic, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think being a veterinarian is a little bit of a like being a psychologist. So I think that, I guess, one of the things I tell the school is maybe they need, that's not exactly the business courses, it's the empathy for the people related to the animal. I don't know how to explain that, except sometimes I think that people really can't afford to do the things they need to do, and somehow you have to be empathetic to the fact that not everybody can do everything for their animal. I mean, especially when you have people come in and they don't have all their teeth. I mean, you know, they don't have a lot of money. They love their animals, though. Mm -hmm. So I've always taken into consideration the love of the animal and what I could do for it. To, you know, maybe it wasn't the best medicine, but it made it well. And, you know, it wasn't like there could have been a better procedure, but there's no way they could do that. But the animal would be comfortable and out of pain and could live a few more years. And most people just want you to take care of the animal the best you can. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I guess there's... Some psychology, the empathy of the people's feelings, you know. I don't know how to say that, but I don't know if we got a lot of that in school, but I think that's a matter of um, experience, maybe. Right. Yeah, but I think it's really important in veterinary medicine because I have people that their children have all moved away, their grandchildren aren't close, they're in their 80s, and their little dog is their life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's their whole life, having their dog be well enough to sleep with them and go places with them. So I think veterinary medicine is really important in that manner. So, yeah, I've loved being a veterinarian. Do it again if I was young. Well, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> thank you.